Hello, I'd like to welcome you to another session of The Greatest Books. Tonight we will be discussing topic four in our series in political philosophy, politics. We've looked over the last oh, six or seven weeks over the various topics beginning with methods, methodology, we've looked at psychology, we've looked at ethics, and we've been preparing for the study of politics. So I'd like to begin that tonight with a quick summary of what we, have, what we did last time in ethics. And we're into this politics, the study of the good life for the community, the study of the good life for human beings in community. We said at the conclusion of ethics that human beings must achieve their end by having certain things. The, hum the human nature, the free will and the rational mind uh, compel the human being towards their end, which the philosophers identified as happiness. All human beings desire happiness. Happiness is the end, and we saw the means to achieve that end are the virtues, moral virtues and intellectual virtues. Aristotle said there were also the need of what he called the totem bonum and the summum bonum. The totem bonum are the total goods necessary for human beings to pursue anything higher. That which Abraham Maslow in the 20th century called the hierarchy of needs, starting with the basic lower needs, the sustenance needs, food, shelter, clothing, housing, then moving to higher needs of esteem and then love, and then the highest level, if I had those lower needs met, I could be said to be self-actualized when all my potentials were actualized. It's exactly what Aristotle means by human happiness. When all my human potentials are actualized when, and I have all those totem bottoms, all the things necessary, the total good necessary to help me to actualize those potentials and move me toward my end. And of those goods, he identified one as the summum bonum, the greatest of all the goods. That is the, which is the greatest part of my greatest attribute. My greatest attribute as a human being is my rational mind, my intellectual thinking ability. And the greatest attribute of my intellectual thinking ability, the greatest acquisition of that ability, is the acquisition of wisdom, the highest of all the goods possible for a human being. Consequently, I call it the summum bonum. So if I had the summum bonum and the totem bonum, a moral virtue, an intellectual virtue, Aristotle would say, I'm on my way to pursuing happiness, on my way to leading a good life. But he goes on at the end of ethics in the transition to politics to point out that it's not possible for a human being to pursue this happiness without the benefit of the community, without the benefit of the social um, community, human life and human development and the human pursuit of happiness would be impossible. So Aristotle says that the human being is a zoom politikon, a political animal. And this word political has its root in that Greek word polis. The Greek city-state was a close-knit, small community of citizens who met each day to communicate the higher ideas, to discuss politics, to discuss life, uh, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the good, the true, the beautiful. Men engaged in discussion about the higher things in leisure time. That was, the, for Aristotle, the highest point of political life. Other things were, happened in the community, but the high point was when those citizens came together to discuss the city, to discuss the end of human life. And that's why he says we're a political animal, we need the polis, we need this political community, we need the community, and more particularly we need the political community, meaning the community in which we associate with one another about the higher things and the ends of life. Now, there's some um, evidence that Aristotle was correct. For example, if we look at human beings raised in isolation, we see defect in the ability to communicate, defect and retardation. The, the, um, the, uh, by the retarding, we mean the stopping, the, the inhibiting of human growth, retarded growth, uh, n not moving towards our end. We can't raise human beings in isolation to study inhibited or, pr or growth, but we can look at other animals, such as chimpanzees or higher primates, whom psychologists have in the laboratory studied the effects of isolation on higher primates. And almost er every time, these uh, end can be replicated. The chimpanzee that was raised in isolation for a year or several years, being brought into the community of normally raised chimpanzees with normal uh, group uh, companionship and contact, the one that was raised in isolation always ends up in the back of the cage in this self-absorbed, which come to be known as the classic self-absorbed rocking motion. Just rocking in the cage, that poor little animal can't handle the stress of communication, can't handle the stress of the group. It's forever wounded, forever inhibited, forever um, limited in its growth, forever scarred by the pangs of isolation. Now, we can't do that to human beings, but we can sometimes study human beings 
who by one mistake or one reason or another have been raised in isolation or almost in total isolation. We call such p children feral children. One was at the turn of the century the wild boy of Avignon, uh, Avignon, France, where this boy turned, they found him out in the woods, brought him into the community, fed him, tried to bring him back to some type of normalcy without much effect, just tearing at his food, wild erratic behavior, not able to communicate, mumbling, giving signs, not able to acquire a symbolic language. This was the effect of isolation, the effect that isolation has on feral children. And because this child was past the period of plasticity, it's very difficult to acquire those human attributes of the language, the symbolic language, and the complexity of that type of communication. What is easy for a child, because it's plastic, it's being molded, it observes and, and, and imitates at the early stage, it's easily molded to a type of behavior. That period of plasticity, the psychologists tell us, is past by the time we reach adolescence. And these people who come in isolation at that point are, are probably wounded for life, scarred for life, deeply wounded, probably never able to pursue anything higher. It's a terrible malady to be raised in isolation. The human being, as Aristotle says, needs the group in order to grow, to pursue happiness. There are other reasons we need the group. One is just the, the f sheer fact of survivability. The human being doesn't have instincts. We don't have the physical accoutrements that animals have. We don't have the fur to keep us warm in the winter, sharp claws to help us uh, you know, fight our prey, fangs to rip meat, speed to run, or speed to catch uh, fleeing food. We don't have the sentient acuity of speed, flight, or camouflage that hides us in the woods or in the desert. We lack these things. Human beings don't survive by physical accoutrements. They uh, survive and grow by cultural acquirements. The human being survives and flourishes not on instinct, but acquired cultural traits that are passed on from generation to generation. And these cultural traits are communicated through a complex symbolic language. So the human being cannot survive and grow without the benefit of the groups, because like, unlike other animals, we don't have the physical abilities that allow us to do such things. We need the culture, we need the group, we need to make tools, we need to adjust to our environment, overcome our environment, not through our physical ability, but through our mental ability. That's why we're called homo sapiens, the wise animal, the animal that uses his mind or her mind and communicates those things on through complex symbolic language from generation to generation to generation. Without such complex language and communication and passing on the cultural heritage, without the benefit of the group, we never could do such a thing. The human being is a cultural animal, it needs that, that group to survive and to grow. Also, the human being has a longer period of dependency than almost all other animals. In the womb for nine months, then once outside the womb, you can't take this baby and put him out in the woods or say to walk. The baby's not going to walk, then I'm going to crawl for months and walk, not going to walk for a year or more. It has to acquire language, it's not able to defend itself. Other animals grow rapidly and they have these sharp instincts that allow them to survive. Some are almost at it immediately. Others take longer, but none take as long as a human being. That period of dependency is, is prolonged. And that period of dependency means we will be killed, we will be destroyed in, by nature without the group to protect us, to nourish us, to sustain us in this difficult period of, ad, of infancy. As a matter of fact, sociologists are telling us this period of dependency is increasing and increasing and increasing as the human race moves forward to the modern world. In America, some people say the dependency is these days lasting all the way till 30. Adolescence has become a protracted period. Children are staying home longer than ever. They might go away, but then they come back. There's this long period of protracted dependency. And this, the point is, human beings need the group. And when you seem to need the group to survive and to grow, and that survivability and, and the necessity of growth seems to be more acute in more advanced societies than it is in more uh, primitive societies. Humans need to grow, we need to develop this language and to communicate it to pass on our culture. We need the acquisition of culture, we need education, socialization, uh, norms, the heritage, the tradition, and good laws. All these things help us to grow and to protect us in community. Now, what all these things have in common is the necessity of common life, community life, life in a, um, in, with, with a culture. So if human beings are compelled to live in a group, if human beings are compelled to live in society, if we must do it for survivability reasons, if we must do it for growth reasons, if we must do it because of our long period of dependency, then we say the human being is by nature a political animal or a social animal. Human beings must live in groups, and groups are complex, and groups have conflicts, groups have to have structure, groups have to have guidance, and for groups to have structure and guidance, and to order that complexity, there's a need of a governing authority. There's a need for wisdom. There's a need for law. And so Aristotle argues 
that government is natural to man, just as it is natural to live in society. If it's by nature necessary for human beings to live in society, it's by nature then necessary for human beings to have government to regulate that life in society. This is something Aristotle said is almost an innate disposition. If I could use the word instinct, I would use that word. It's, it's that powerful. That government is almost instinctual to human beings. It's part of our nature. It what defines our human relationships. It defines the human species. It's a necessity of government, not something men choose to do. It's something they're impelled to do by their nature. This is a very important point Aristotle's making. Don't, you'll see later the idea gets challenged. It gets adjusted in the Middle Ages, then it gets rejected in the 17th and 18th centuries. Right now, let's understand what Aristotle's saying so we understand what happens to this idea later. He's saying that human beings can freely choose the type of government they have, be it a democracy or a monarchy or a... a um, a aristocracy. We can choose the type of government, what he called polity. The polity is the type of government. But we can't choose to have government itself. All human beings have had government wherever they've been. The fact that we have government is natural. We're impelled to it by our needs to live in society and regulate that life in society. But the very fact that we, the type of government, that's our choice. The fact that we have government, we're impelled to, uh, it's part of the natural law, which man does not create, but which he discovers with his mind. Politics provides the environment in which human beings pursue happiness. Government provides that environment which we, in which we can pursue our happiness based upon our nature, which only unfolds in society. So this state, this government, arises out of a human need, and this, it originates in our bare needs of life and continues to exist for the sake of the good life. Let me say that again. The state arises out of a human need. Government arises out of a human need. Our need to pursue happiness, our need to survive, our need to grow, our need to communicate, our need to pass on culture, our need for each other. It arises out of that need and the bare needs of life, and it continues to exist, not for those bare needs, but for the higher needs, for the sake of the good life. The state is something Aristotle says is natural, not artificial. It's based upon an internal impulse because it's necessary for man to live and to survive and to mature to, to achieve his or her end, to achieve their potentials. Now, in looking at human nature, Aristotle says, now, before we go on, let's back, stop here for a moment. We said that human beings have an end. The end is happiness. They need to pursue that end. And to pursue that end requires them to live in community. Since we're required to live in community but for various reasons, we need a government to regulate that community. Now, that's all we've said so far. It goes a little deeper. In Aristotle, looking at human nature, through observation, discovered a flaw. There's something wrong with human beings. It seems that the lower passions are fighting against the higher reason. Uh, there's, some, there's a law in man's nature that seems to fight against the reason. It's what uh, has been called by Christians original sin. Uh, Sigmund Freud called it the id, the impulsive, instinctual, primitive energies that, that work against the civilization or the culture. Uh, Carl Jung called it the shadow, the dark, seamy, mysterious, primitive side of man. People have recognized this flaw for centuries. If you call it original sin, shadow, id, whatever you want to call it, Aristotle recognized it was there. Man has this flaw in his nature. Man has this flaw in her nature. And because we have this flaw, we have to do something about it. The problem is we have to live in a group to, to reach our potential. But if people are living like animals, satisfying their physical desires, we may end up killing each other. So if we have these passions and those passions aren't regulated and we act upon those passions upon each other, we end up hurting each other. So we're satisfying our desires and in the process we're hurting each other, maiming each other, killing each other. Consequently, another need for government is law. Government law to protect me. Law not only to regulate life, but to protect me in my pursuit of happiness, to protect you in your pursuit of happiness. Because the very group that I need to, to nourish me, the very group I need to help me to attain my end, the very group I need to help me pursue happiness, is the very group that can threaten my existence. And so this cannot be permitted. Human beings cannot grow and achieve their end, cannot pursue happiness, unless there was some other way to put a stop to such a thing. And that stop, we say, is provided by government. It, otherwise, the, the need to live in social groups would, be, would work against itself. We'd be thwarted by the very primitive nature of our human um, uh, composition. So we need some other thing to make this uh, viable. Consequently, we say, this government that we need also has requirements. It needs power and authority. It needs power and authority to punish, to command, to prohibit. It needs these great things because human beings 
are not going to unfold and achieve their potential automatically. We must pursue these things, and we can harm each other in the process. So the state needs power and authority. Power is defined as the might to rule. Authority is defined as the right to rule. Or authority more um, adequately defined is the right to issue to others binding obligatory regulations. Government must have the power to bind us with obligatory regulations and have the power to enforce those regulations. And Aristotle said, good government should be composed of good men who make good laws. Good government should make good laws. Good laws that guide us to our end. Good laws that provide peace. Good laws that help us to pursue our end. But of what value are good laws, he asks, if the government lacks the power to enforce those laws? Of what good is authority if the government doesn't also have power to back up its authority? For example, in the Supreme Court case uh, of Chisholm versus Georgia, when John Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall, sat on the bench, it was a famous decision, Chisholm versus Georgia, involving President Andrew Jackson and the Cherokee Indians in Georgia. The Cherokee Indians, the court argued, had a right to private property, had property rights in Georgia. Andrew Jackson wanted them out of Georgia over the Mississippi River in the Oklahoma or the Indian Territories. He didn't, but the Supreme Court passed its decision. The president didn't like the decision. But guess what happened? The Indians didn't get their property in Georgia. Andrew Jackson marched them over the Mississippi, and he said, John Marshall has made his decision. Let him enforce it. Let him enforce it. He's just one man. I'm the president. I have the executive power. I have the police power. I have the military power. I'm the one with the real power here. He wants to make a decision. How is he going to enforce it? I have the power. I'm not using that power to back up his decision. I'm using that power to do what I think should be done by the executive, the president of the United States of America. Consequently, the Indians are going over to Oklahoma. Now see, what good was the Supreme Court? It has authority, but it had no power to back up its authority if the power that was invested in the president wasn't used by the president to back up the authority of the, of the courts. So the government needs not only authority, a legitimate um, right to issue obligations, but the power to back up those obligations. And this is a major area of contention in political science. You know, uh, how did government get this power and authority? How did government arise? Where did it come from? Where did the power and authority come from? It's a great question. Now, we just saw that Aristotle says this power and authority comes from nature. It's part, it's inherent in the natural law because of human needs to live in society. Later on, we'll see Thomas Aquinas say it comes from nature and from God. When Pontius Pilate said, you would have no power over me or no authority over me, uh, I'm sorry, Pontius Pilate said, don't you know who I am? I can release you or I can bind you. I can let you go or I can hold you. And Jesus said to Pontius Pilate, you would have no power over me unless it came to you from above. Aquinas will argue that power and authority that adheres in government isn't just part of the natural law, it's part of the divine law that comes to government from God. Well, later on in the 18th, 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, you see this whole idea challenged when Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and the Founding Fathers say it doesn't come from God and it doesn't come from nature. It comes from a contract, contract theory. And the contract theory ends in the idea of popular sovereignty. The power doesn't come from God, power doesn't come from nature, power comes from the people. Well, regardless of which one of these points is correct, it's not our point here to examine those things. We will examine them as this course unfolds over this year. Right now, we want to say, regardless of where power and authority originate, everyone agrees that they're necessary for effective government. Because government has to provide the following, Aristotle argues, and provide these things it needs power and authority. One, it must provide for the common good, the good of every single human being, not a group or a, or a clique, but every single human being. We're all humans. We all have the same need to pursue happiness. We all want to grow. And government is instituted to protect our rights for the, to pursue happiness, the common good, all people. We need government to guarantee us justice and our inalienable rights, which help us to pursue our end, and alien rights that we have because we're human beings. The government must assure those rights are protected, because if those rights aren't protected, we cannot pursue our end of human life. We can't reach our potential. Government also exists to provide peace, what we call external and internal peace, because without peace, no one can pursue happiness. We need internal peace, peace from internal resurrection, riots, those things that disrupt domestic life. And we need also external peace, peace on our borders. We need an army and a military to keep us um, safe on our borders so there can be peace within the community. Peace from outside, peace from inside. Further, government must provide order. Without this order is related to peace. And without this order, we cannot have the type of peace that we need to pursue happiness. 
Further, government has to assure us of liberty, the freedom to exercise my rights. My rights are no good to me, your rights are no good to you, unless we also have the liberty or the freedom to exercise those rights, free of being impinged upon by some other one or some other group of people who might not want to see me or you exercise your rights to pursue happiness. We must have government that's impartial to protect our rights and our liberties. We have governments necessary to create laws to protect the community, to, pr to promote the pursuit of truth and beauty and goodness, and to provide us, lastly, with an efficient administration of the laws. If government could be doing those things, then Aristotle was satisfied that it was doing those things necessary to help human beings achieve their end of happiness. These are universal functions of government. They're the very reasons we have government, the foundations of government. Now, I would remind you that human beings have to pursue happiness. It's a need to develop our human potentials, and this is only possible as a social being, which necessitates the existence of a government to protect my rights and my liberties, which include the right to possess the totem bonum and all I need to live a good life. I have to work for those things, but I have a right to those things that I work for, and I have a right to use those things for the pursuit of my human happiness, as so do you. But we can't have those things, we can't have those things protected, we can't pursue happiness without the peace and the government to assure us of this peace. So, we say this possession of the totem bonum, the possession of the goods that allow us to pursue happiness, are exterior habiliments, exterior possessions. But I also need interior habiliments. I need interior possessions. As I said when we studied ethics, we need the intellectual and the moral virtues as well. But none of these things I need are innate. None of these <laughs> interior habiliments are innate. I have to acquire them. And I cannot seek the good life without these greater acquisitions of virtue. I, if I have physical goods, they're not enough. Without virtue, I don't have enough. I will not be able to reach my end. The goal of every legislator, Aristotle said, is to make men good, to promote good habits and growth and virtue, so human beings can freely choose the good and move toward it. Not the job of the government to give us happiness. It's not the job of the government to guarantee me happiness. It doesn't say we're guaranteed happiness. We're only guaranteed the right to pursue happiness. It's our choice. We must acquire those goods that make that possession of happiness possible in the long run. So these virtues are not innate. And the question comes, before us then, well, if they're not innate, can moral virtue be taught? It's a serious question that we ask ourselves, that has been asked by political philosophers for centuries, for millennia. Can moral virtue be taught? Can men be made good? It's one of the primary problems of politics and the laws. This question has intrigued political philosophers from antiquity, and it was foremost in the minds of the American framers as well. And the solution, of course, we saw in ethics, is, is, is that it's more important to do the good than to know the good. It's more important to do the good than to know the good. That I can't teach a person to be virtuous. We saw that last time. I can't teach, I can teach them what virtue is, but teaching them doesn't make them virtuous. As we saw, then if, if I can't teach them to be virtuous, how do I make them virtuous? I, well, we saw that you become virtuous by doing virtuous deeds. As we saw in ethics, if we're, if we're compelled though to act correctly, that that's not really a human act. That what's more important? To know or to do? Remember, we said it was to do. Can we teach human beings to be good? The answer is no. Not in a classroom. That, that intellectual learning must be facilitated with moral learning, action. But if human beings don't have know how to think correctly, they won't know how to act correctly. So we saw that problem last time. How then do you get people to act correctly so they can think correctly? And we saw that that is habilitating people to act, they're being compelled by the power of the law, being subject to the law of another. And we saw being subject to the law of another, though, is not a moral act. We call that heteronomy. Heteronomy is being subject to the law of another. And if you're subject to the law of another, that's not a moral act, it's not a human act, because a human act requires both understanding and a free act of the will. I'm being forced, I'm not really free. But being forced to do it gives me the habitual nature. It makes me get the character of Virtue. I'm not virtuous unless I freely choose it, but I have the habit of doing the right thing. The habit of doing the right thing prepares my mind for the higher things when I can discover the good and then have a moral strength to do the good I know. So we say for the politician, it's more important to do the good because doing the good prepares the ground for virtue. First, intellectual virtue, then moral virtue. It helps prepare us for such moral acts because it stops my bestial behavior. This, this compulsion of the law stops me by habituating me towards good behavior. And my soul is being led to virtue, which must be intellectual first, but I cannot have this virtue if I do not first get the passions under control. 
So we say that the government makes laws, and those laws have compulsive power, and those compulsive power laws habituate me to good action. And my virtuous life is dependent, therefore, upon proper socialization, rearing, education, and good laws. Aristotle said, it's difficult to get from youth up a right training for virtue if one has not been brought up under the right laws, because these laws are what habituate us to doing the good things. And it's not, if we don't have good laws, human beings are going to do wrong things. They're going to enter into all kinds of behaviors that m weakens their moral strength and their intellectual ability. So it's necessary for legislators to make good laws so human beings get habituated to the good, which later on becomes virtuous. Surely, Aristotle said, he who wants to make men better by his care must try to become capable of legislating, for it is through the laws that we become good. So the study of human nature reached its high point in the study of the laws and constitutions, he says. We should study it. That means the legislation, the constitution, the laws. We must study it, the law, the constitution, he says, in order to complete, the, with the best of our ability, our philosophy of human nature. We have to study the laws because human beings come up in the society and we adopt those laws of our society. We revere them. And if they don't match our human nature, those laws can hurt the development of human nature. They're very, it's very essential to know human nature so we can make the right laws that guide us in the development and the pursuit of happiness. Remember, we said men must know the good and be habituated to good actions and training of the will to know and to do the good. We said it's better to, to do than to know. But if you, if you do not know the good, then you'll not be able to do it. If you don't know it, you won't be able to do it. So what, how are you going to do it then? Again, through the authority or the persuasion and the force of the laws. It's why the legislator must know the human soul to know what is good for man in reaching his temporal end and administering justice as well as providing peace and promoting liberty. Men can be made good through laws because through force they can be habituated to do the good. The government has this power and the first and greatest power is persuasion because persuasion touches my interior, it touches the interior of man. You can persuade me and understand the reasons. I'm, it's, it's, it's very powerful because it's working on the inside out then. And I understand what you're asking me and I fully consent. But if persuasion does not work, then the only force is left. If I can't persuade a human being through reason, we're living in a community, and this community must help each other. We must achieve our ends and our goals. If I can't persuade you through reason, then what else are we going to do to protect the community? We must compel by force. Compel by force to protect the community, and compel by force to habituate a bad person to do good deeds, to prepare them for the better life, so that they can pursue happiness and truly be happy, not just pleasure-seeking. This is why Aristotle's book on ethics was followed by the book on politics to help assure that the good discovered in ethics and ethics would actually be done for the individual in community only very few he thought develop virtue and acquire wisdom and he saw that education and socialization and the laws were the key even a plato agreed with aristotle on this point when i was an undergraduate at Notre, the university of notre dame there was a joke that passed around my senior year, the class of 79 in our yearbook. And at the end of the yearbook, it said that every student at Notre Dame has to study three books. The first of those books every Notre Dame student has to study is Plato's Republic. The second book was Plato's Republic. And the third book was Plato's Republic. We have Plato's Republic drilled into us in the College of Arts and Letters at the University of Notre Dame. And Plato makes many points, but the one that stuck clearly in my mind was the education necessary for leadership, the education necessary for virtuous and good leadership. It was not a four-year bachelor's degree in political science. It was a 25-30 year degree that included practical experience, politics, administration, uh, uh, the, the, the practical affairs of prudence, and then the higher studies of philosophy and human nature. It was a long, prolonged study, 25 to 30 years. Then a man could become a political leader because that man was to be the sagacious leader of a community, meant to lead the community to happiness or in the pursuit of happiness. And this idea of education, socialization, and good laws led Aristotle to believe that virtue is only possible for the aristocracy who should govern the rest through drafting good constitution and writing good laws. Only those few who had the free time through leisure, the wealthy, what he called the aristocracy, had the leisure to study the higher things. And those few people, rightly or wrongly, I'm not criticizing Aristotle, now I'm just trying to understand him, we'll critique him later. 
Rightly or wrongly, he insisted that only the few, the aristocracy, who had the ability to pursue leisure, should make the laws. And those laws would either uh, persuade people to be good, and if they could not persuade them to be good, then compulsion was necessary. And the good life must be discovered first the intellect and acted on morally. If it can't be discovered the intellect and acted on morally, then we need good laws to guide people to do those things they haven't freely chosen to do for themselves. Now, this requires leisure, he said, to pursue truth and wisdom. And most men don't have that kind of leisure. So Aristotle concluded most men can't have virtue. Since most men have worked with their hands, are slaves or artisans, are foul ones, the wicked ones, he said. The ones who work with their hands are the wicked ones. Aristotle wasn't alone on that. That was a cultural judgment of work. Only the aristocracy, the few with leisure, were the good and could be virtuous. The others were foul and were bald and, and the wicked, not because of... Of, of their work per se, but because their work tied them down to the necessities of life and never had any free time to pursue the higher things. It was those few who had the leisure to pursue the higher things who were thought to be the better judges of, of the laws and the better makers of the laws for the rest of the community. Now this idea led Aristotle to the further idea of natural slavery, the claim that some men are by nature slaves and better ruled if ruled by another. And one recoils at Aristotle's use of the idea of natural slavery. And I am among them, of course. But to rightly understand what he's saying is that if those people don't use their minds and strengthen their will to live the good life, it's better if they were ruled by someone else who was living their life correctly. It's better to be a slave of a wise man than to be a slave of your passions, was Aristotle's conclusion. And since many, many souls were slaves of their passions, he, ins he insisted that that was a not it was so prevalent and dominant over the face of the globe, it seemed to be a natural state of many human beings. So he argued for natural slavery. And it was better for a natural slave to be subject to a wise, virtuous person than to be subject to their own foolishness and weakness of moral character. Because if they followed their own selves, they would destroy themselves. Better to follow a wise man as a slave than be a free man and destroy yourself, was Aristotle's argument. Now, in fact, the Greek word it said for, uh, for, for worker was the wicked ones. Slave uh, was the, one of the wicked ones. But with Hesiod, Aristotle would have concluded, and I said this last time in the study of ethics, but it's a, a, a wonderful quote. Hesiod said, Best is he who knows all things himself. Good is he that hearkens when wise men counsel right. But he who neither knows nor lays to heart another man's wisdom is a useless wit. I think that's a good place to end this presentation one in politics. The necessity of law, good law, leading people to the pursuit of happiness. And without that good law to guide people in community, we would be left to the laws of our passions, blind guides of uh, instinct, and we would never pursue our happiness. So the necessity of living in groups, necessitated government, the government needs to make laws to guide us in the pursuit of happiness, to protect us, to regulate life, to provide us peace, and all those other functions we've explored tonight. So it seems that government is natural to human beings, and we want to look next time at the relationship of liberty and rights to government. Tonight we've said a lot. We hope you benefited by it, and we'll continue the discussion next time as we continue to pursue the greatest ideas in political philosophy. Good night, and God bless you.